Hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for uh, joining us in the uh, for this uh, special lecture today. My name is uh, Dave Einoff. I'm a uh, 1981 uh, graduate uh, in Earth and Planetary Sciences, and uh, I've had uh, an opportunity to, to spend a lot of time doing Hopkins-related stuff. Uh, I have a son who graduated in 2016, and when he graduated, he was the ninth member of his family to have graduated from Johns Hopkins. So, a little bit of a uh, little bit of time in the organization. I currently uh, sit on the uh, uh, Alumni Council and am an ex officio member of uh, Gene Challenge's uh, uh, advisory board for the Krieger School. And uh, I would uh, uh, like to, uh, to welcome uh, the James B. Knapp Dean of the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences, uh, Dr. Christopher uh, um, it, uh is with great pleasure. I finally had the opportunity to meet him face to face. This is a great, great thing. Uh, Chris returned uh, to Homewood, so he is, uh, he's a bit of a, a boomerang for us uh, after serving the past three and a half years uh, at Georgetown as the Dean of the Georgetown College of Arts and Sciences. Um, he joined the Krieger uh, faculty in uh, 2005 uh, in the Department of uh, German and Romance Languages uh, and Literatures and served uh, a number of roles uh, rising to the Vice Provost of uh, Faculty Affairs before uh, decamping for uh, Georgetown in 2017. Uh, excitingly, uh, from 2010 to 2014, uh, Chris was the director of the Amer American Academy in Rome, which um, I will let him explain, which is the uh, US's oldest center for uh, the study of uh, independent art and humanities research based uh, outside of the country. Uh, prior to that, um, he was a, a faculty member for uh, nine years at uh, Michigan State. Uh, he's recently published this attractive uh, book, which I have, in fact, read from cover to cover, uh, which is uh, uh, from Cambridge University Press titled The Italian Renaissance and the Origins of Modern Humanities and Intellectual History, uh, 1400 uh, to 1800. And uh, it is a fascinating read. Uh, and I would, uh, I would suggest uh, that uh, it's clear from this that uh, uh, Chris has a, a tremendous uh, uh, breadth of knowledge and I look forward to hearing his conversation. Uh, once uh, he finishes his presentation, there'll be an opportunity for QA. Uh, there are two mics located uh, at the end of the aisles here, so please uh, take advantage of those. So uh, I'm thrilled that Dean Chalenza can join us today and uh, look forward to hearing more about uh, the role of arts and sciences in our world today. Uh, please join us in uh, welcoming Dean Chalenza. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dave. Nice to see you. I appreciate it. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm really, really absolutely delighted to be with you today and deeply, deeply grateful that you're all back. I mean, I think that um, just to be in person again it's so meaningful and so important. So it really just warms my heart to see you here. So thank you for coming back. Um, and, and I'm really delighted to talk a little bit about the arts and sciences today. Um, and so for the next three hours, what uh, I kid, I'm just kidding. Um, no, what I, what I do wanna do though, what I'd like to do is just give you a very brief portrait of where we are now as Krieger, but then think together about where we've come from. And then we can sort of start to speculate about where, where we might be going. What are the current challenges that we face in the arts and sciences, what are the challenges that our students face um, all around the world today? So let me, let me do the most exciting thing that I can do in any kind of talk and read some numbers at you. That'll be my plan. So Krieger School of Arts and Sciences, we've got um, basically it's all of the humanities, all of the natural and physical sciences and all the social sciences are housed within the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. We've got 22 academic departments, 40 interdisciplinary programs and centers, We've got right now about 3,400 undergraduate students, about 1,000 PhD students, almost 600 full-time faculty of whom about 340 are tenured or tenured track, meaning that they're research active faculty who are here for the long term. It's an incredibly dynamic community. It represents all the shapes of human knowledge that you can find in their purest form. And that's indeed really what the arts and sciences I think are all about. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk talk to you about today. Um, and to do that, what I'd like to do is ask you to keep in mind a series of dates. And I'm going to say a little bit of a word about some things that happen at each of those dates. The first date's an approximate one, 430 AD. I know, it's a long time ago. 
Keep that one in mind. The next date I'd like you to keep in mind is the year 1200. The next date are two dates. The year is from 1300 to 1500. Then the date 1810. And then finally the date 1876. I really wanted to talk about how certain signal moments in the history of um, uh, intellectual endeavors took place at each of those times. So, so the first date, 430. Um, why do I signal this? Well, the distant ancestor of the arts and sciences is what we call the liberal arts. Um, often today, when we talk about the liberal arts, we use that notion as a stand-in for the humanities, but it really never was only that. It was always about the limits of human knowledge at whatever time. So the liberal arts in antiquity, um, they, when they come up in, in Greece, they come up in Rome, they were never, it was never anything political, right? It was never about liberal versus conservative. It really was always related to the Latin word for freedom, liber, to be free. So the liberal arts were the kinds of things that you should learn to give you a free intellect, a way of thinking freely in the world. And the reason this, this date in the early fifth century is important is because it was then that a thinker who's known for only one thing that he wrote this book I'm gonna tell you about, put together an encyclopedic summary of the liberal arts at the time. Um, the book was called The Marriage of Mercury and Philology, and the thinker's name was Martianus Capella. He was from what is now Algeria, and like many in the expanded Roman Empire, he wrote in Latin. He used dense mythology and allegories and things like that. But basically, as he summed it up, the liberal arts at that time were seven. There was a set of verbal liberal arts, and there was a set of scientific or natural liberal arts. So the verbal liberal arts, these were grammar, rhetoric, and what he called dialectic, and we would call now logic. So this is all about how do you use language? How do you use words? How do you persuade people, right? It was, and it was a sum of everything that was known at the time. The four mathematical natural arts were geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and music. Um, geometry was much broader in his day than we think of it today. It was related to the Greek words for earth and measurement, ge ge geo and metria. And so it's all about how do you think of the earth? How do you measure it? And then it also has to do with things like points and lines, the kinds of things you think about in geometry today. Arithmetic to the basics of number. Um, astronomy, which was also thought to be physics. You know, how did the planets move? How did you measure them, right? How did you observe them? And then finally music, the last of the mathematical liberal arts was noted because of the harmonic ratios. And all of these things were thought to be in some ways constitutive of the world, right? They constituted the world as it was, but they could also be studied. So Martianus's um, encyclopedic treatise was important because on the one hand, he, he, did, he, he wrote it in such a way that um, it was a little bit humorous for his day. He had these allegorical personifications. The, the conceit of it was the marriage of Mercury and philology was this, the god Mercury, who was thought of by the ancient Romans as a god of action and swiftness and running around and transmitting messages, had to pick a wife. Um, and everybody else uh, denied him except for philology. And philology is really the study of languages and letters. So it's like a, a union of activity with thinking, right? That's the conceit. And the bridesmaids are the seven liberal arts. That's how the treatise proceeds. I will tell you um, that its humor would be lost on us today. It's like, you know, when you, when you watch an old movie or something, you know, and, and, and the humor is just so out of date. So the humor doesn't quite work. But what was important about this work was it served as the repository of knowledge for the liberal arts throughout the entire European Middle Ages. So think about that. One age was ending, the age of the Roman Empire. Another age was beginning, the age of the European Middle Ages. And so the liberal arts, this is a kind of a summative work. Anybody who knew anything about the liberal arts used this or something like it to, to learn about them. So we can now leap to the second date I mentioned. That was 1200. Uh, that is a year that we can use as a stand-in for a bunch of associated developments in what we can call high medieval Europe. And that set of developments has to do with the birth of the university as we know it. Now, there had been antecedents to higher education in Europe and indeed in the Islamic world um, in the early Middle Ages with madrasas, but there was really nothing like the medieval European university. And it's really to those medieval European universities that we owe some of our most distinctive customs and titles and things like that. So that date, 1200, was the date when um, the then king of France, Philip II, uh, gave a kind of a charter uh, to the University of Paris it's a whole bunch of other documents from that period that talk about that university. But there's a couple of features we can talk about with this early university. The first was that um, 
It consisted of four faculties. So the first faculty was called the arts faculty. This is what the liberal arts had turned into in those intervening centuries, right? This is you know, current state of the arts at that time. Um, if you went through the liberal arts faculty and were trained and deemed to have been trained well enough, you would have gotten um, what was known in the Latin sources of the time as a baccalaureus artium. What does that sound like to you, right? A bachelor of arts degree. If you stayed another year or two, you would get a magister artium, a master of arts degree. Um, and that second degree, the master of arts degree gave you something very important. In the Latin sources of the time, it's called a licentia ubique docendi, a license to teach anywhere. And what that means is that your credentials from that university were not only local, right? They were generalizable. So if you went and you got this degree in one university, let's say in Naples, you could then go teach in Paris. So, so, so that, that's the lower faculty. That's what the arts faculty was called. And then there were the three so-called higher faculties. These are the fact the professional faculties of medicine, theology, and law. Those took sometimes 12 years to get a doctoral degree in those um, faculties. Now I mentioned all this about the medieval university for a couple of reasons. The first is that what was key, especially as recent scholars have studied these universities have known, is that the key was community. A brilliant French scholar named Jacques Verger who writes about this with great eloquence. Um, the scholars and the students, they formed a community. And in fact, when we look at some of the earliest sources for universities, the locutions that we find point to this notion of community. For example, um, one way that universities are described in medieval sources is this way. They use the term the universitas scholarium et magistrorum. The whole, because the word universitas just meant the whole, the whole of group of scholars and students, right? So that was one way that they were referred to. And another important way was studium generale, so a general study. And there that general part is important. The stuff you learned in one university could actually have validity elsewhere. So in this early instantiation of universities, we see some of the things that are important today. First, there's a kind of a freedom associated with them because part of what the sources tell us in the 13th century is that scholars would be able to do their work freely and teach it freely, um, and that it was the community that would regulate it, right? And it was the sense of community that was important. Okay, what about that next set of dates, 1300 to 1500? Well, here's what happened in that time. In the year 1300, we can count about 16 of these universities. By the year 1500, we can count well over 60 of them. So think about it, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the model worked, right? It tells us that they started to become instruments of prestige for local medieval states. You know, if you wanted to have a powerful cultural city, you would, you would, you would found a university. And it tells us that the model works. And basically that model, the so-called arts faculty or the lower faculty, and then the three higher faculties, even though there were of course local variations, that was pretty much the model that existed at the time. Believe it or not, that model, that basic structure persisted all throughout the Renaissance until the year roughly 18, until the year 1810, until let's say the late 18th century when new experiments started to be in the air. So this date 1810, why is this date important? Well, imagine how much knowledge proceeds over centuries. Right? So, and imagine for example, that all of those liberal arts that were in that so-called lower faculty, the arts faculty, those had turned into modern subjects. They had turned into modern subjects like physics and chemistry and history and classics and literature. And all of these scholars in the late 18th century started to think, well, we're not just a lower faculty. We're not just preparatory to other things. We're actually um, investigating truth in what we do. We're finding new truths. Right? So they began to think that they should have a doctoral faculty of their own. And so in 1810, what we see is the birth of something in Germany, spurred on by the work of a, a person named Wilhelm von Humboldt of the University of Berlin and the new conception of what he called the philosophical faculty, the philosophical faculty. From that point on, all of those disciplines that were thought to be lower disciplines, preparatory disciplines, all of those disciplines could now be disciplines in which you could get a doctoral degree. Um, why was it called the philosophical faculty? Well, the thinking then was that all of those diverse disciplines, kind of like what we think of as the arts and sciences now, basically humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, each one of these fields was looking for truth. 
but philosophy was the best at judging truth claims, hence the philosophical faculty. So if you've ever wondered why chemists and historians and so on have doctor of philosophy degrees, that's why. It goes back to this moment in 1810. So, so what happens after that? Well, a couple of things. The first is that that model is tremendously successful in Germany. It's tremendously successful um, in Europe, and it winds up being imported to the United States. And this is where we can kind of jump over the Atlantic and try to figure out how did we get to where we are. So. One historian named uh, Geiger has described three revolutions in the late 19th and early 20th century in American higher education. The first he calls the um, land grant revolution. This was in the 1860s when President Lincoln signed an act into law called the eventually called the Morrill Act after Senator Justin Morrill. And what Morrill thought was there should be new types of large institutions, land grant institutions that would get a grant of land. Uh, to educate the people whom he called the sons of toil. What he meant by that was really what we would call accessibility. Right? He meant that you know, the land grant institutions would be places where people who didn't you know, come from old families, who didn't have lots of money, but who could still get a very good education, um, both in liberal arts, arts and sciences, but also in agricultural disciplines and things like that. So that's the first revolution. The second revolution that Geiger talks about is the academic re revolution. This is why that final date, 1876, can anybody tell me what that date is? Oh, thank you. Should I do this? Oh, is this better? Okay, we'll do this. Um, I'm on a short lead here. I feel like a rock star. This is good stuff. Um, so that date, 1876, that's Hopkins founding, right? And that, that, that notion, the academic revolution, was when these German ideas made their way to the United States. So some of the old legacy universities, you know, Harvard's, Princeton's, Yale's, things like this, retrofitted themselves to this German model. And two universities, the University of Chicago and our university, Johns Hopkins, were founded on that German model. And there were two key things that Humboldt and others had stressed. One was freedom of teaching. The other was freedom of research. And subtending it all was the idea that the arts and sciences were about the pursuit of truth. So that's the academic revolution. And then the final revolution in the US, and I'm gonna end my little historical piece here before talking about the challenges we face. The final revolution was what Geiger calls the collegiate revolution. What he means by this is, um, you know, around, let's say, the years of World War I, before and after, you see the birth at universities of um, things like big time sports at places that have sports teams, clubs, fraternities, things like that. And I think what's important about that, it, it's the ancestor of what we would now call student services of all sorts. What I feel is important about that is this. I think that there was so much gained along this story of progress toward research universities, but there was something that was lost in translation along the way. What was lost in translation was the idea that part of education is about forming young people who are going from age 18 to age 22, let's say. That's a very important age. Now, in Humboldt's world, way back when in the early 19th century, what's often forgotten when this schematic story that I've just told you is recounted about US education is that Humboldt also effected a reform of secondary education. And it was there in the German world, right, that he thought that the, these things of how do you become an adult, right, the old function of the liberal arts would be imparted to students before they would go to a university and be part of a research community. I think in the US, that's something that we have to start thinking about again now in research universities. Remember, these students are coming to us at age 18. They have vastly different experiences when they come to us. Nobody has a standard experience anymore, right? Now at Johns Hopkins, I'm very proud to say that 27% of our entering class are first generation limited income students. We're doing something very important for social mobility, but that's also gonna mean that people are coming from all different places and it, and it has to be us in universities who rise to meet the moment and meet those students where they are. So, so those are the, you know, the, the, a little bit of a historical development of research universities. And then I, I did say I wanted to talk a little bit about challenges we face. Um, and I guess to be the biggest challenge that I see right now, and, I, and I'll, I'll wonder in the conversation that we, we have together if you agree with me, is, I would say most fundamentally a reading problem. 
And what I mean by that is not just reading literature or books or texts. What I mean is that um, as a historian of the Renaissance, who has often studied and taught about the rise of printing with movable type in the 15th century, I think I can say with some authority that the media revolution we are living through now, let's say the last 20 years and what we're living through now, is bigger, faster, broader, more uncertain in its directionality than any previous media transformation we've ever had. We are, we, we are surrounded at every moment by these wildly undulating waves of information that are hitting us on phones, on screens, um, on watches, right, on computer screens. And, and I think for our young people especially, this is to say for undergraduate students, I think the biggest challenge as they go through their education and as they go on to become leaders um, is gonna be how do you read that world? Right? How, how do you actually read that world? How do you take that information in? I think it's a big challenge. Um, let me share one brief anecdote with you from um, the book that Dave was so kind to mention. Okay, and I'm gonna ask you to just indulge me here for one quick second, leap backward in time again. I wanna take you to the late 17th century in France. Um, this is a time when France has been through and then settled a series of debilitating religious wars with um, a, a lot of um, you know, gruesome warfare in its most recent memory. This is a time when there was a lot of skepticism in the air, um, the idea being, you know, how could you know anything true about the world? This was a time after the death of the philosopher Descartes, who had died in 1650, and had really changed the way people thought about themselves and their relation to the world. And so in the late 17th century, I want to introduce you to a person who is probably a name you haven't heard. He was a Jesuit, and his name was Jean Hardouin. And because the, la the, la the language of scholarship back then was the Latin language, he, was often, he often signed himself as Hardouinus, and that's how I'll refer to him. So Hardouinus was a lot of different things. Um, but the one thing that he was most prominently was he was an expert in the ancient Latin language. He was so good in Latin that he was asked to curate um, an edition for the monarchy of France of an ancient Latin writer named Pliny. It was an ancient encyclopedic work which had a very complicated history to it. Um, and and Hartovinus was so good at this that contemporary classicists today, I mean, still think that he discovered things about that text that are still worth it, that were still legitimate discoveries. So, so the first point I'm trying to make here is this guy was no crank, right? He was, he was a smart person. He was a good professional person um, in his field. But then something happened. And as he later writes in an account that was only revealed posthumously, he says that he started to have suspicions. He said he started to suspect that the work of Augustine was a fraud. Augustine was one of the church fathers who had lived from 354 to 430, you know, one of the pillars of, of Western intellectual history. He, starts, he started to think, Hardouin, Hardouinus did, that St. Augustine's work was all fraudulent. Then he started to look back, and eventually he started to think, wow, a lot of other stuff I don't think, I think it's all fake. He started to think that almost every single canonical ancient Latin and Greek author was a fake. He had about five that he thought were authentic. He thought Homer, you know, the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey was authentic. Herodotus, the great Greek historian was authentic. Uh, most of Cicero he thought was authentic. Um, he thought that Virgil's um, Georgics were authentic, but not, the, poet, not the, the great poet Virgil's Aeneid. He thought that was a forgery. And what he said was, all of this was made up by medieval monks, and, and they made it up because they wanted to give themselves a backstory for, for, for their heretical imaginings. And then he says this, he says, the reason we can know this now, remember he's writing in the late 17th century, the reason we can know this is that now that printing with movable type has grown so much, because printing by that point um, was well over um, 200 years old, he says, we've emptied out all the libraries. By that, he means that we've, we've taken all the handwritten books out of the libraries. They've all been printed. We can, he says, we can compare them all. And now I know. I know it was all a fake. And from that moment in his life, he went back, and all the other work that he did was devoted to trying to prove that some of these works of literature were fake. 
Virgil's Aeneid, right? This is the great Roman epic of ancient Rome, right? The story of ancient Rome, the thing that people have memorized for centuries, right? To, to learn good poetic Latin. He said that was a fake. And he said he found out why. He said it was done by a medieval Frenchman. And the medieval Frenchman had actually, he just knew good Latin. And the medieval Frenchman had invented all this. And to prove that, he did something that was canonical in his day. He did a, a multi-line commentary to this work. And he examined every poetic line. And he would do things like say, oh, you know, this, this place here where Virgil talks about fires in Rome as Aeneas is leaving, um, he uses a word that he shouldn't have used. The word he used is actually, uh, you know, a reverse translation from French into Latin. He actually sort of used this other Latin term, right? So in other words, once he made that dip into conspiracy thinking, it colored all of the rest of his work. And, and I mentioned this anecdote. We, we can now zoom forward to the, the contemporary. I mentioned this anecdote not to, you know, engage in, arcane trivia, but just to show that this was somebody who was smart. He was an expert. He was at a moment of technological change and change in media. And nevertheless, he, he, he went down this rabbit hole of conspiracy thinking. And so when I think about the current environment that we have now, when I think about the world we live in, the world our students live in, when I think about the fact that um, on the one hand, the information revolution has produced a lot of good things. Right? We, we can find out information much faster than we could have before. Um, information's been democratized um, in, in many ways. But then there's this other side of it too. Right? There's this side of, quote, doing your own research, unquote. And, and, and I think that you know, what we've seen, right, as we've seen during this pandemic, um, this has led to deaths. Right? People who, for whatever reason, right, you know, they, they, they've gone down rabbit holes to try to, to say, well, vaccines, this one can't be right even though these vaccines that we have for the pandemic are the results of hundreds of thousands of scientists working over the last years on things like mRNA, right? It's not a secret conspiracy, right? But no, no, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And so I just think that, you know, that little curious case of this strange French Jesuit in the 17th century, all of that type of potential to go into conspiracies is radically magnified in our era because we don't really have trusted sources of information anymore. And I think it's going to be on our young students to build up new ways of reading. I think it's gonna be on us to try to experiment with and to try to teach it. And I think in all of our fields, right? In every single one of our fields, um, we have to find ways to communicate what we're doing to the public. So if on the one hand, a research university is about the pursuit of truth, and I'm gonna to stick to that. That's like the hill I die on, right? That what we do here is about the pursuit of truth. This isn't, it's not all relative. We might not know the truth today or tomorrow, but that's what we're working toward. Um, if one thing a university is about is research and the pursuit of truth, the other thing I think it has to be about is what I would call broadly speaking translation. In other words, letting the public know, letting beginning students know why that research is important, why it's being done. And then for our undergraduate students, this I would say is my biggest goal over the next say five years, you know, God willing I should live so long as Dean, um, is I want our students to become makers of new knowledge, discoverers of new knowledge. In other words, I think the time has passed to be passive recipients of knowledge. I think it's now time for education to mean that students have to be the ones who are um, part of that process as well. So, you know, at the Krieger School, we're doing a lot of things right now. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is get a plan together for the next five years. We want to focus very hard on that undergraduate experience some of you, I hope, will be delighted to know that this fall, for the first time in the history of the Krieger School, um, every entering first year student, every entering freshman will be able to have a small seminar with a full-time faculty member. These will be limited to 12. Um, and our hope is that through that, it's a tone setting moment for these students, that they'll get to know what a research university is about. They'll meet somebody who fell in love with the field um, and, and, and really start to begin this journey of, of having a new kind of education. And there's a lot of other things we're working on on that front. The second thing we're working on is we're trying to expand our faculty, not expand our student body, but expand our faculty, because the truth is this is a research university and our faculty are excellent at what they do. Um, and because of that, we wanna have more of them to interact with our students. The third thing we're trying to do is we're trying to better our graduate programs, um, not so much make them better in quality because they're quite good in quality, but we're trying to change the way we think about what the career outcomes are for graduate students. That's a little uneven in higher education today. 
especially in the fields of the humanities and the social sciences. What do you do with a PhD if you're not in academia? Because not all of them go into academia. We want to make that an open conversation. And then the final element of what we're trying to do is we want to develop more public voices on our faculty. Um, we want, um, if, if we have a brilliant historian who's just won a prize-winning book, but it's a book that maybe is a little bit arcane and specialized, we want that faculty member to maybe be able to do a podcast on it or write an op-ed about it, right? Or in other words, get the message out. I think there's an incredible hunger among the public for new knowledge, but I think it's gonna be on us in universities to explain ourselves to the world. I think it's just a basic good in itself. I think even a private university like Hopkins, right? We are a nonprofit, right? So there's some way in which we're very connected to the public. Um, so I think that's, that's where we are. What I've tried to do is just give you a sense of, well, you know, where did we come from, right? Where the arts and sciences especially come from this truly ancient tradition um, through medieval universities, through the Renaissance, through the early modern era, through the early 19th century, through the kind of um, interesting ways that heritage was adapted in American higher education. But now we're, we're really in this new moment, I think. We're in this moment where we have to think a little bit differently about all the, all the great parts of that heritage, the pursuit of truth, especially, the freedom of research, the freedom of teaching, but how we adapt it to this, this uh, technological uh, revolution through which we're living. So thank you very, very much for your kind attention. Um, so I know, you know, what we have, I think, plenty of time for questions, it looks like. So I welcome your questions. There are microphones. Yes, please. Thank you very much for the, I think, very fine summary. Um, I'm a graduate who was pre-law when I was here, but I did discover after I got here, really, the lack of a religion department. And I wonder if there's a strategy that you have within the faculty to compensate for that hole yeah. in the, uh, historical disciplines you've described. Mm -hmm. um, I found ways to get religion in a sense here, yeah. but it was through intellectual history and a very strong history department, yes. especially. Yeah. Thank you, that's a great question. So, so that question points to, I would say, a particularity of our founding where um, Daniel Coit Gilman and others who were involved in the founding uh, really believed in, an, I would say, an almost overly militant way that any university that was devoted to the pursuit of truth had to be fully, fully secular. So there was actually a resistance throughout the whole history of the university to having something like a religious studies department, which many other universities have. Um, now, I mean, that said, I would say that many of the folks um, throughout uh, our arts and sciences, our faculty are working on rel topics related to religion, right? Many of our anthropologists, right, deal with this. Um, we, we have um, uh, a program in Islamic studies, for example, um, but, but I feel the lack. I mean, I think that a good religious studies department is something that's very interesting. They tend to be multidisciplinary departments with anthropologists, historians, et cetera. Um, but it, you're right to say that this is something that it, it was intentional, actually, I mean, at the outset, which is interesting. So, but it's a good question. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dean Chilenza. My name is Peter Davos. I'm Arts and Sciences, class of 2000. I'm a first gen. I double majored in uh, political science and classics. And it's amazing what the university has done to empower those students to be able to come here. Uh, one of the questions I have is how do we convince the parents of those students who are so keenly aware of the need to get a return on the time that the students invest that this academic path is worthy and that they don't you know, major in something more practical? Great question, thank you. That's on my mind a lot, actually. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways we can talk about it. So, so um, the, the first thing is I think that the, the breadth of the arts and sciences and certainly of the disciplines that you're, you're talking about that you majored in political science and classics, um, one of the things that that gives you broadly speaking is um, ways to situate yourself in the world critical thinking, I think you can think of them as job training, not for the next job, but for the fifth job, right? Because what we do know is that our students now are gonna change jobs probably once at least every 18 months for the first 10 years out of their bachelor's degree. 
And so what that means is you really need to have that, that ability to think critically about a lot of different fields, to think about who you are, where you're situated. So in some senses, I think that a good liberal arts education within the context of a research university is some of the best career education you can have. Another thing that we can say, and this will be interesting to you, um, there's also a kind of bottom line thing about this as well. So you'll be surprised to hear, maybe, or maybe you won't be surprised to hear, startlingly enough, uh, in a survey, I think a year ago, that we did of our students, um, the highest starting salaries came for, I wonder if anybody can guess what major, at least within arts and sciences. It was English majors, interestingly enough. So I think you know there's plenty of career pathways now. What I do think is important, though, is there's a few things that we have to think about. The first is that there's a kind of cycle to development for students. I think the sophomore year is very critical because I think what happens is that students, you know, they're through the freshman year, right? They've been through the first year, they're habituated. They might see colleagues, let's say, in engineering who seem to have a much more linear pathway. Like they kind of know what they want to do, right? And that's admirable. But I think what we need to do is we need to connect those sophomores with alums who've majored as you have to be able to say, you know, my career path might not have been linear, but these are the choices I made. This is how I made those choices. And this is what I did. We have a vigorous network of kind of humanities alums. There's a society, I think, of English major alums who do programs. And I'm hoping during my time as dean that we can do a little more of that so that the students then have better ways to talk to their parents about it. Because it's understandable, right, if you're a parent. Um, you know, that, that you want to make sure that your, you know, your child whom you love deeply, right, is going to be able to do well in the world and succeed. I am convinced that you can succeed with majors like the one you had, but I, I do think we need to talk about how it happens more. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what I'd say. There's, I mean, there's a lot, though, that I think we have to work on about this, because I do think that there is this, there, there are these senses that students have that they, you know, um, I don't know, they, maybe they don't feel like they have the right cohort or something like that. So we need to build the community a little bit more. Any other? Oh, here we go. Oh, we got two coming up. There's a race for the microphone. <laughs> So what you just said about connecting undergraduates to alumni yeah. is uh, done in uh, certain graduate schools, certainly business schools. Yeah. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little more on what you have in mind, how you would recruit um, alumni to do this, et cetera. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, um, I think, so I guess a couple of things. What I'm hoping to do is um, develop some cohorts of students and then develop cohorts of alumni who would be willing to serve as mentors. Um, I can give you one example that I experienced that when I was away at Georgetown, there was a program uh, that had been designed for um, liberal arts majors, but who wanted to go into business. And what happened was over time, it was 50 years old by the time I got to Georgetown. So what that meant was there was this very rich sense of a cohort and there were alumni and the alumni would really commit to, you know, mentoring two or three students at a time. So it's not a flood of students, but it really means, you know, you as an alum commit to taking the phone calls of that student, of the current student, the people who are here. I found that very effective. And I also found it a way of thinking about the rich kind of polyphonic way that we can all contribute to success. Um, I mean, it's fantastic, right, when Michael Bloomberg gives $150 million, right, to do, you know, STEM education for underrepresented students. That's great. But all of us, right, can do something like this. And I think something like alumni, when people say, how can I give back? This is a great way to give back. So I think, you know, we will be working, right, with our alumni relations to try to find ways to do this. And I think all it would take is just willingness, right, willingness to take those phone calls, willingness to engage. So that, that's where we're at right now. Hi, my name is Michael Schneider, and I'm a proud graduate of the class of 65. Great. And I was uh, thinking about the purpose of a university education. And broadly speaking, it's my opinion that the purpose should be to advance the human condition, broadly speaking. But in order to progress and develop new knowledge, I think there's a need to transfer existing knowledge. Now, you can't teach everything that's known at the time. But I think you can 
promote an understanding of the what is known by, I guess, requiring a course in the intellectual history of the world. Now, you can't teach dates and all of that, but you can get a feeling for what is the uh, the evolution of human thought. And you could also look to the present by giving a course in the history of science and technology. And in my opinion, those two courses ought to be taught to everybody, whether they're destined to be scientists and engineers or uh, other professions. And it seemed to me that built on that will be the opportunity to teach how to create new knowledge. And that's, I'm wondering if you've given any thought to that. I know the requirements, there were required courses when I was here. Yeah. Um, but I understand that there are no longer uh, required courses or some limited number. And I'm wondering if you've given that any thought. Yeah, thank you. No, a, those are great points. Um, so, so I guess I can answer by, by telling you about a couple of things that are going on. The first is that some of you may know that there was something called the Second Commission on Undergraduate Education ended its work about four or five years ago. And it ended, it, it, it made a lot of very good recommendations, but nothing concrete. And we're now at the point of trying to implement them. So one way of thinking about what you, you talked about was some kind of common, common core of experiences, at least, will be either these first year seminars, where, 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 where you'll find a lot of lively discussion among faculty members is, um, you know, a historian would say, um, you know, our traditions, let's say, Western traditions of intellectual history and knowledge have been deepened and broadened by the study of other cultures over the last, you know, 30 or 40 years. So the real question is, you know, what would you put into a required course, number one? And then two, how would you ensure that you adapted it over time? One thing that's happened around here for some time that was developed by my colleague Walter Stevens was a, what, was, what was called a great books course. And I taught it in a few different times. And the beauty of that course was that um, it wasn't always exactly the same books, but the same candidates would pop up. So there was almost always you would read Homer's Odyssey, for example. And the beauty of things like that was that you, um, you realized that there were these groups of students that were all having the same sorts of experiences, the same conversations about the same works, and that too gave them a kind of foundation. As we're thinking about this new curriculum that we're trying to put together, the way we're talking about these foundations is the, it's called the first year foundation. So after these first year seminars, which will be very broad, so they won't be on any one given thing, right? There'll be things that are related to what the faculty members are doing, but they'll be suitable to thinking about the foundations of how knowledge is created. There will be a writing component in the second semester so that you know, we really have a brilliant new director of our writing program who's come here named Matt Pavisic. So there's definitely gonna be a little bit more than there has been traditionally here I wouldn't go so far as to say it's like a core in the way you have a core at Columbia University, just because the ethos here is that. But I mean, I will say, broadly speaking, I do agree that there's got to be some sort of shared knowledge. I think that's one of the crises that we're undergoing right now is there's not as much of a shared knowledge base. As, as always, the devil's in the details, though. But I appreciate the point. Um, yeah, why don't we go to this side? Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, Jeff Doshna, uh, ANS 96. Okay. Um, I started off as a poli-sci major, but I switched to economics and it was good. And then I took some other classes yeah. and that sophomore year was really important. And I, I'm glad that you were talking yeah. about that. And then I took some classes and figured out that I wanted to do something else. I took some geography classes and the geography professor kind of put me in on the path of what I do now, which is I'm a faculty member at Temple University. Okay. Uh, and uh, in a field that we don't have here at Hopkins, city and regional planning and yeah, community yeah. development. Um, so the two, I, I was happy to hear about this small seminar thing because I think that that connection with full-time faculty is really critical early on and helps folks figure out what options are in front of them because I'm in something that I did not even know existed yeah. until a faculty member told me about it. Uh, and as a first-gen college student, I was figuring it out as I, as I went along. The thing that I want, maybe you can talk a little bit about though, is the path for folks pursuing PhDs. 70% um, yeah. of faculty across uh, universities across the United States are contingent. Yes. Um, adjuncts and full-time contract faculty, and the fact that half the ANS faculty are tenure track or tenured is fantastic, yeah. but where I work at a 
are one big public research yep. university. Lots of public schools mm -hmm. don't have that yeah. luxury. So I'd like to know maybe a little bit about how you're framing um, sure. for, for those various career paths for folks who might want to stay in higher ed, but knowing that it's just not the same old uh, career as it once yeah. was. Yeah. yeah, boy, I, I thank you a lot for that question. Yeah. That is something that is, we're deep into this. And so um, I won't go on all day about this, but I'll go on a little bit about it. Um, so, so first of all, the figures you cited are, are exactly right. And you know, for, for those of us not, in, for those who might not be in higher education, there, there's a big difference. And for students, they'll, they'll just, you know, anyone who's teaching, they'll just say that's a professor, right? But there's different types of reasons why professors are hired to do different things. So tenured and tenure track professors are people who will have been hired for their promise in a certain field, the promise that they'll be one of the discoverers of new knowledge. Uh, it's very difficult to become tenured at Hopkins. Um, but if they do, the hope is that these are people who are then on a pathway to keep engaging in that mission of discovery for the whole 30 to 40 year length of their career after that, right? which means that if they're in the humanities, they're writing books and articles. If they're scientists, they're winning big grants from the 19 institutes of the National Institutes of Health, the NIH or the NSF. Um, they're, they're progressing, they're adding new knowledge, right? Um, but then, as you point out, right, all throughout the US, um, there's been an increasing reliance on non-tenure track faculty. Why is that the case? Where is it happening? So there's a subset of universities called the American Association of Universities, the AAU universities, Hopkins is part of that. The percentages in those places are kind of like ours. So we're much higher, right, than most other places in, in our core of tenure track faculty. But on the other hand, as you point out too, we've got about a thousand PhD students in our different, you know, our different programs. Now, in some of those fields, um, there are pathways to careers that are pretty reasonable in most of the natural and physical sciences. Um, but in the humanities and humanistic social sciences, it's not so clear what happens. And so we're doing a few different things. The first is this. Um, in the sciences, well, the first thing we're doing, I can tell you right now, actually, we're finishing up, is we've gathered data on the last 10 years of PhDs. Um, and we've asked our departments to validate where are all the people that graduated now? Like, what are they doing? So I wanna have some real talk with our departments. Where are people, what are they doing? Um, now in the natural sciences, the granting agencies, most of the, the research funding for science in the US comes from the NIH or from the NSF. The granting agencies actually now demand in their, in their proposal submissions that you, if you get one of these grants, are part of a unit that is offering education about alternate careers. So for example, in our biology department, there's now a credit bearing course for PhD students that can week by week tell us them these are other things you can do with the PhD in biology. Recently at Hopkins, I'm very grateful to our fantastic provost Sunil Kumar, who set up a program called Futures with a PH. Um, and it is precisely about this thing. It's about introducing students to things they can do at the PhD um, that are, are wonderful, fulfilling, valid, important careers, but that might not necessarily be academic careers. And in fact, in Krieger, what we just established this year, this is a big project for me and I, my Vice Dean of Graduate Education, Mary Favret, we just established for the first time um, the Johns Hopkins Society of Fellows in the Humanities. And what's different about this, we offered eight post, nine postdoctoral fellowships. What's different about this from other analogous programs like this around the country is that a number of the, the fellows are gonna be working on things like how does academic administration work? There are gonna be some that are community partnerships. And so I think those are the things we need to do. There was a wonderful program, I'll just say one more thing, uh, that the American Council on Learned Society sponsored a number of years ago um, that was for humanities PhD students who were interested in doing things outside of academia. And what the ACLS did um, ACLS, American Council of Learned Societies, is a social association. And so, you know, people sort of pay in a little bit and then they can do things with their funding. They're also a re-grantor for the Mellon Foundation. What they did was they partnered with places like museums, publishers, other cultural institutions. And so if you were one of these selected PhD students who was interested, you'd finish your PhD, you'd be guaranteed a year or two of employment at one of these places. And the beautiful thing was that a lot of these um, folks continued with those institutions. 
And, and that program has ended and they're kind of you know, weighing how it succeeded and how it didn't actually succeeded quite a bit. And my feeling is universities can do that ourselves. I think for us at Hopkins, um, you know, we're, we're basically adjacent to the nation's capital city. There's a lot of cultural institutions there. We have a number of our PhDs from the history of science and technology work in the Smithsonian, right? And I think that there are all these pathways that we wanna talk about. So the challenge before us now is recognizing it, right? And I think there's been a sea change, I would say what I've noticed in the last 10 years around here specifically in faculty members being much more open to having those kinds of discussions. I mean, the problem as you can imagine is we don't know stuff about anything besides our disciplines. Right, so if I'm a medieval Latinist, right, which is sort of what I am by training, I don't know how to tell you to retrofit your CV for a corporation, right? I can't do that. But what I can do is be open to the conversation. And that's kind of, that's, that's what I'm gonna be using the megaphone as Dean for, is encouraging every department chair, every faculty member, have those conversations with your advisees on day one and make sure they know that if they go in that pathway that you're gonna see that as a win. So, so there's a lot of others. I mean, I appreciate the question. You're really right, though, that it's a, it's a national a national issue. Um, hello, how are you? Hi, yeah. So uh, you mentioned that the four years for an undergraduate are particularly important in their development. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on what skills or traits are kind of set when they, when they arrive and which ones are malleable? Yeah. Um, I have my own thoughts. Um, for example, I think people's general ethics are fairly well set and don't yeah. really get influenced. Mm. I think their uh, ability to interact with others mm. in a healthy way, yeah. uh, it's a particularly pr important, you know, four years. W what are your thoughts on, 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 yeah. on those? I think it's a really important question. Um, you know, one of the things that happened at the end of this uh, second commission on undergraduate education report is that they recommended a series of foundational abilities that we want our graduates to have. Um, one of them, for example, is um, being able to express oneself in writing and orally, right? You know, in a, in a way that matches the kind of moment we're in. Um, another is um, uh, a sense of citizenship in the world. Another is an ethical sense. So we have to think through though what we're doing there. I'll give you one example that's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, in the next 10 years, there's gonna be probably hundreds of billions of federal dollars coming toward two big areas. One is neuroscience broadly conceived. So you know, places like the NIH and things, they're, they're gonna have funding coming. We will of course take part of that. The other one is artificial intelligence. Um, and a lot of this has to do with global competition with China and so on, right? So the federal government is gonna be doing this. I feel like, let's take artificial intelligence, for instance. Um, one of the reasons why we are enmeshed in this complicated moment of information um, uh, intake is because the way we're getting a lot of our information is by algorithms, right? And what the algorithms are doing is they tend to reinforce your own unconscious biases, right? You know, you, you, know, you start out you know, watching a video about, you know, a political figure and, and five clicks later, you know, you're deep in the midst of QAnon and people eating babies and things like that, right? It just sort of, it, it, it pushes you this way. So I kind of feel like as we're developing what we're calling the AIX initiative around here, the artificial intelligence plus other stuff, right? I think anything that has to do with anything curricular with our undergraduates, I feel like they should be taking courses that will immediately make them think of what are the downstream consequences of the things I might be doing technologically. I mean, we've seen this with Facebook, right? I mean, this is something that, you remember the happy talk at the beginning of Facebook, right? Everybody would be connected, it would be great, we'll all share pictures. And you know, there's a lot of good stuff there and a lot of parts of the world where it's used, you know, as to run businesses and things like that, but then it's also the home of some of the most toxic conspiracy theories that there are and people. So I think there's, I think the ethical thing is something gonna be very important for us. And neuroscience is another thing. Like as we're teaching about neuroscience, a lot of this has to do with the integrity of the human person, right? So there has to be a, a sense of ethical um, things developed. So I think it's on our mind right now. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Um, Cameron Smith, class of 78. Yeah. Um, question that which isn't unique to Hopkins, but I've observed it over many years is the conflict between faculty who might possess good teaching skills and yeah. talent versus yeah. faculty who are 
really research stars. Yeah. Yeah. And then sense system seems to be more towards the research stars. Yeah. How do you develop yeah. and attract faculty who have that talent for yeah. teaching, which obviously would make for a better undergraduate experience? Oh, I couldn't agree more. Great question. So, so, so listen to this. A Johns Hopkins PhD student, a former PhD student named Jonathan Zimmerman, just published a fascinating book called Amateur Hour. And what it is about is it's about the history of the way American institutions of higher learning have evaluated teaching over, since basically the late 19th century to now. And the long and the short of it is what he shows in the book is that, um, you know, you mentioned research at research universities. There is basically a sort of agreed upon set of norms, professional norms for how you judge progress in research in all the different fields, the humanities, the social sciences, natural science. Maybe humanities, maybe it's, you know, somebody just published an important book with the scholarly press and some more articles. Social sciences, maybe it's articles in high impact journals. Um, and the sciences, as I said before, it's grants and things like that. But what Zimmerman shows in his book, Amateur Hour, is that colleges and universities have never had that conversation about teaching. Meaning that it tends to be thought of as either it's a gift that somebody has, or it's not a gift, or, or you know, people are you know, born teachers or they're not, and so on. But what the last 20 years or so of research into education has shown is that teaching is a skill and you can learn to do it better. So we have, for example, um, something that is right now situated in the library is actually coming to the Krieger School called the Center for Educational Resources. It's changing its name. It's directed by a very dynamic director named Dr. Mike Reese. And we're really make, we wanna make sure that we expose, especially our younger faculty, because right? these are the future, right? The people who are gonna be here for the next decades to precisely the kinds of things that can make them better teachers. Um, because I will tell you, I think that when people have even some of that training, there's nothing more exciting for an undergraduate student to be in a classroom by some, with someone who's like leading the field in their research, but can also find a way to really make you understand well, why does this matter? What does it mean to you? How did, how did you get there and so on? So it's very alive right now. And I, as I say, I think it's kind of curious and interesting that it was a Johns Hopkins PhD student who wrote this book about the ways that American universities don't you know, pay as much attention to teaching as they probably should. Crucial though, I think if we're gonna get this new undergraduate piece right, um, it has to be something that is validated. One more little thing I'd say is that, um, you know, I've been here on and off since 19, uh, since 1905, not, not, not long, since 2005. <laughs> I feel like Mel Brooks's old thousand year old man. Yeah. Um, little Mel Brooks reference for you guys. Um, but, but I've been here since 2005. What I will say is there's a sea change in the way faculty see teaching around here um, over the last five or so years. Um, to give you an example with that, the new first year seminars, we, we're gonna have to run about 75 of these um, in, in the fall. And my colleague, uh, Bertrand Garcia Moreno, has been one of the animating spirits behind this. You know, I was talking to him about this and he said, we were worried at the outset, will we get enough people? And instead, no, there's a flood of faculty who wanna do it. So I think that's just interesting. I think there's sort of a new, a new desire to connect with undergraduate students as well. So I'm kind of, I'm cautiously optimistic about this now, about the desire to do it. But I do think we have to use some, get some more um, conversation going about the professional ways we judge teaching, right? How, how we talk about how do you get better at it? But thanks for that, it's on our minds. So. Oh my God, it's utter silence. All right, folks, thank you very much for being here. It was great to be with you. Have a great day. I will see you at all the events. Um, all done.